Uh, this is an interview with Victor Cananzaro at the Freeport Armory, Freeport, Long Island, August 9th, 2002. It's approximately noon. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Could you tell me your full name and your date of birth and place of birth, please? Yes, um, uh, my full name is uh, Victor Nicholas Cananzaro, and I was born in Brooklyn on August 5th, 1921. Um, before you went into military service, what was your pre-service education? Well, I attended um, law. Uh, I'm sorry, I attended St. John's. I graduated from St. John's uh, with a BBA in 1943, and immediately went into service from there. Okay, I did spend uh, from 42 to 43. I was considered a private first class in the Marine Corps, uh, attending college. Did you uh, have any pre-war work experience? Uh, uh, very little. I worked uh, while I was going to college. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were you uh, drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted. Um, uh, draft would have been inevitable, but I did want to finish my college education and the Marines gave me an opportunity, so I took it. Why did you select the Marine Corps? Well, the Marine Corps was... Uh, uh, popular in my neighborhood. Uh, I uh, had a, f a friend uh, who was in the Marine Corps and, uh, uh, and he had already joined and uh, I enjoyed his uh, relationship and uh, so I wanted to join also. Okay, why don't you tell us from, I guess after you graduated then uh, and your uh, basic training and so on? Well, um, upon graduation, uh, September 1 is my date of graduation. On September 15th, I was in Paris Island attending boot camp. And there I stayed for three months, which is the usual, and um, completed my basic training. And from there, I was um, transferred to uh, Quantico, Virginia for officer candidate training, school I guess you call it, and um, <clears throat> spent uh, three months before I got commissioned. Upon getting commissioned, I was assigned uh, field artillery. So I attended, I attended uh, field artillery classes in Quantico uh, for an additional three months and uh, <clears throat> completed my studies there. And from Quantico, I was shipped uh, to San Diego. San Diego, um, uh, Coronado Island, there was a naval base there, and um, I was assigned um, uh, <coughs> uh, naval gunfire training. And from uh, Coronado, we would um, uh, go to um, San Clemente Island, I think it is, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> San Clemente Island uh, and uh, spotted for naval ships that were um, preparing to join the fleet marine force. I'm sorry, the fleet for, uh, naval force. Uh, in fact, one of the exciting moments there was the, um, the firing or spotting for the North Carolina battleship. I hadn't had that experience and to spot for 16 inch guns was quite a thrill. What happened after that? Where did you? Well, from um, just yeah, from uh, San Diego, <coughs> I was shipped up to um, Calif uh, San Francisco, uh, and uh, from there, I was flown to Hawaii on one of those flying boats. Uh, it was 14 hours <laughs> from from San Francisco to Hawaii. And um, <clears throat> upon arrival, immediately joined um, uh, the 4th Marine Division that was stationed um, in, um, on Maui. Uh, Maui uh, uh, <clears throat> is one of the principal islands there, as you know. Uh, <clears throat> our training continued. 
naval gunfire training. Uh, there was an island off the Hawaiian Islands called Kahalawi. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. But it was a gunnery island and uh, uh, naval ships had to qualify before they joined the, the fleet in the Pacific. And um, so they would put us ashore on the island in a bunker and we spotted for the naval ships that were practicing or qualifying. Uh, from, from Hawaii, uh, the next thing, uh, chain of events, um, we uh, boarded uh, or on January 1945, we boarded troop ships and um, headed for the Pacific combat area. And we went past the Marshall Islands. And one reason I say that is because the 4th Marine Division, that was their initial assault, the first uh, uh, action they received, and they took that island very easily, and then went to Saipan. From there we went to Saipan. Uh, on Saipan, um, we did some further training, and we actually had maneuvers landing on, uh, on Tinian, the island of Tinian. By this time, both islands had fallen into American hands. And <clears throat> so from um, Tinian, uh, <clears throat> we put on ship, troop ship again, and traveled um, to Iwo Jima. And um, we assaulted Iwo Jima on February 19th, 1945. Did you watch any of the uh, pre-landing uh, uh, firing on the island? Uh, the the ship oh, yes. Firing? Yes. Oh, uh, very definitely. I was in a landing craft. I landed at H plus one, mm -hmm. my outfit. And so I was in a boat um, uh, preparing to land when uh, the first troops hit the beach. And it's very interesting. Um, uh, <clears throat> The uh, ships, and there were lots of ships, we, we had a tremendous naval force. The uh, ships uh, that were in support of the troops all um, zeroed their guns on the water, uh, water line. And um, at, um, <clears throat> at the proper moment, they began to raise their uh, target so that they were 400 yards ahead of the landing troops. So they just formed a protective blanket and um, just went forward and until once the troops hit the, hit the beach then the ships would be under the control of the uh, naval gunfire spot, uh, spotter. <clears throat> so um, I had a, a tough experience if I'm allowed to talk about no, it. No, that's what we want to hear. Uh, <clears throat> my landing boat um, hit the beach but the bow wouldn't go down. It was stuck. Somehow it got jammed. You were in an L? L LCI? Uh, no, it's one of those landing boats. Just by forward. The ramp went well, forward ramp goes down, and uh, <clears throat> and the boatswain was all excited because he says, "I got to get the hell out of here." He said, uh, <clears throat> "This boat is going to breach." I guess the word is that uh, it would swamp. That was mm -hmm. he, he was afraid of, and um, they did a good job of keeping it perpendicular to the beach and avoiding the waves coming from the side. Uh, <clears throat> but then when he couldn't get the bow down, he said, well, the men will have to go over the side. Well, I was standing back where the boatswain was, and um, I said, you can't do that. These men have um, uh, packs on their back. How deep is the water? He said, it's over eight feet. I said, well, they'll just go down like lead. So we said, let's try it again. He said, I'm not on signal. We'll just have the men push forward and knock it down. So um, we tried one more time, and he's yelling, here come the mortars, here come the mortars, because now we're sitting ducks. Uh, and uh, so um, it worked. Uh, uh, when it was time to uh, knock the bow down, uh, it released. And uh, so we landed. We jumped in water, it was no more than three feet deep, just got our feet wet, so to, so to speak, and uh, we landed. At that point, um, we hit the beach, and uh, 
you have to get off the beach because the beach was under constant uh, fire. And uh, I got off the beach, moved inland, and um, <clears throat> was not committed. My, uh, my operation wasn't committed until uh, the next day. Uh, and I replaced a, a fellow who was a friend of mine uh, uh, who was severely injured, uh, lost a leg, and had to be given 23 pints of blood, but that's a different story. Uh, ben Rizal was a great guy. I went to school with him in the, in the military. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, at that point, um, we were now committed and moving um, on the extreme right flank so that uh, the whole line of operation landed about, we landed about here. This is the area of the landing and we landed about here and moved this way and so I had an extreme right <coughs> flank to uh, support the troops. Uh, I had um, assigned to me one destroyer a day. Uh, one destroyer a day uh, <coughs> and um, at night the uh, destroyer would be moved uh, to the rear and fire um, star shells so illuminate the background to eliminate uh, enemy movement. Um, <clears throat> uh, some of the experiences... Why don't you explain what you mean you had one destroyer a day? How did you work with this destroyer? Okay, right. Okay, each destroyer, and I have a list of them um, which is not important, uh, <clears throat> each destroyer would uh, fire at uh, my command, if you will, and sometimes it was direct fire, but I uh, would pick out the targets and um, since we were going along the beach, naval gunfire was very appropriate because the naval gunfire is like a, a rifle. It doesn't lob the shell over a hill. It can only hit targets that are on the surface. And uh, so it became very appropriate to have uh, these ships uh, assigned on that uh, basis because one, you prevented the enemy uh, from attacking along the um, the beach and getting behind our lines, uh, <clears throat> but the important thing was to lend support to the troops in, as they advanced. Uh, <clears throat> I said every day, and I meant every day, with the exception of one day, I got a battleship assigned to me, the battleship Nevada. And uh, of course, uh, the, you know, these ships are, are close to shore. They're, they're probably about 1,500 yards offshore. And, and give support to the troops. We picked uh, <clears throat> uh, gun emplacements, which were pretty much beaten. The, the, the things that we had to look for were small uh, machine gun nests and uh, to support the troops. Uh, <clears throat> now, about the um, oh, fourth or fifth day in, uh, <clears throat> into the operation, I was assigned three LCIs in addition to the destroyer. Uh, and um, the um, LCI, one had um, rockets on its deck, one had mortars, large mortars, which were, uh, uh, weren't too accurate. You had to use them for harassing fire, for uh, deep penetration. And um, the other one had 40 millimeter guns uh, <clears throat> mounted, which were really anti-aircraft guns, but they uh, to use for uh, uh, sh uh, support of uh, uh, advancing troops. Uh, <clears throat> so we had uh, a plan, Colonel called uh, uh, an attack of dawn attack, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I have been told that uh, and I had never fired rockets or mortars or uh, <clears throat> 40 millimeter guns, but we were told about them when we were in Saipan, part of our training. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what happened, the colonel of uh, one of the rockets, he said, I want them right up there in front of the troops. And I had indicated that we're not supposed to fire these within 500 yards of the troops because they too were on the a base that's not stable. The boat bobs around up and down, they throw these things up in the air and uh, they land approximately where they're supposed to land. 
So um, he, he, I just, he wanted them, and I said, well, you'll get it, but it's your order. And uh, <clears throat> so we uh, <clears throat> gave the uh, instructions to the boat, uh, and uh, they did a great job. Uh, it's beautiful to watch how they just speed, go forward at high rate, and that stabilizes them. They're cutting through the water. They fire one rocket, and it's in the water. Fire another one, and it hits the water's edge. And then all hell breaks loose. Boom, boom. They shot. I figure it must have been about 150 rockets, all within a matter of seconds. Covered an area the size of a football field. Uh, the colonel got all excited. He said, God, he said, how many guys did we kill? Our own guys. And then. I said, I don't think we got any of them. I thought it was pretty good. It was very close. So the troops advanced, and it was, uh, a, 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 it was a great uh, movement. We did suffer casualties, and then we had to uh, uh, retrieve wound, wounded people. But um, it was an, an area that had very little movement forward up until that time. In fact, uh, uh, <clears throat> the only movement uh, we had was we overran uh, the first caves, they had a lot of caves in the uh, I mean, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the first cave that we overran, uh, we looked in, we shouldn't have, but uh, that's where I picked up uh, uh, a Japanese uh, flag, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, right after that, orders were issued. No souvenir hunting, stay out of caves, we're going to blow them up. And from then on, we stayed out of caves. Uh, <clears throat> the hell with, them, with uh, souvenirs. So, um, <clears throat> uh, another incident that was of interest, uh, I give credit to the Navy, because they did such a great job. Uh, one day I spotted a flash of light coming from a tree about a thousand yards ahead of us and um, it could only be a reflection of sun on glass or metal and uh, <clears throat> so I had to assume it was an enemy spotter doing the same thing that I was doing you know spotting for artillery or uh, <clears throat> gunfire and so uh, giving instructions to the destroyer and they could see it so they got in their gun sights and took one shot, and that tree disappeared completely. I never saw such accuracy in my life, but uh, they, were, they were exciting. Uh, the destroyers were wonderful people. They always wanted a lot of action. When, when I had those three LCIs that were firing rockets and mortars and, uh, and 40 millimeters, they wanted to join in, you know. They were very eager. And we said, well, no, let's not cloud the uh, target. Uh, that could be a, a problem. <clears throat> so stand by and uh, uh, we'll select other targets for you. What I need to say about the uh, battleship uh, Nevada, I almost forgot this because I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, the Navy is required when it supports troops to make that the first priority, except for their own safety if they're in danger. Uh, and the Nevada, when I um, spent the day firing its five-inch guns, I only used the five-inch guns uh, for, for small targets, uh, and then I asked them to um, take position at night, which meant to our rear, which meant she had to go from here, approximately, because you're firing ships across the front. You can't fire them into the front. Uh, you got to fire them either away from the front or across the front, and then we asked her, like we did all ships, to go about here to fire star shells into um, enemy territory. The star shells uh, fired at a high elevation and they burst over the enemy and the shell continues, the casing continues and lands in enemy territory. And, and a parachute comes out with uh, a star shell, a star that is very bright and it takes about 15 minutes for it to uh, reach the ground. So uh, it illuminates the area. Now, I wasn't the only one. I mean, the other fronts, my responsibility was just along the water's edge here, so to speak, on the right flank. Uh, <clears throat> but she refused to go. 
uh, <clears throat> you know, Admiral was on top, <laughs> so I had no choice but to uh, uh, notify my naval liaison officer, uh, Willie Berger, and uh, he went up through the ranks. Twenty minutes later, I got a message that the ship was moving and, and will notify me when it was in position to fire. But I must say, for the Nevada, the next day, it was, I later found out, was leaving for Tokyo. So I was putting her at a disadvantage. She was out here, she wanted to go to Tokyo this way, and I was putting her away from her destination. And that was the main reason she didn't want to move into position. But it was an exciting thing for me. How were you in contact with these ships? What did you use? Okay. <clears throat> On landing, I had a, a walkie-talkie. And uh, <clears throat> uh, my crew would be in a, a later boat with um, uh, radio equipment, uh, crank the generate, had a generator, and, uh, and uh, I would connect uh, once I land. Oh, I'm sorry, got to go back. The walkie-talkie, I could communicate to my naval liaison officer who was floating on a boat between me and the ship that was firing. And then he would relay the message to the ship. Uh, upon uh, landing and getting established, uh, I would have um, uh, <coughs> a hand generator with uh, a, a radio that one of the fellows carried on his back. And uh, uh, I'd have a string of wire from that radio because he'd be in a position well, it was relatively safe, and, uh, so that it wouldn't be destroyed. And um, uh, I would have a wire and string it up forward to my observation point. And whenever I went to talk to the ship, I had a butterfly switch. I just said, generate, and he would crank, and I could talk to the ship. Uh, <clears throat> later on, and much later, uh, I had uh, a radio jeep. And, uh, but the radio jeep um, sank on landing and wasn't uh, retrieved until uh, about the seventh or eighth day of the operation. And I was only committed for about 10, 12 days. Uh, and, um, uh, <clears throat> but the radio jeep, of course, was the easiest. Uh, you have your motor running and, and generate the power and, and talk to the ship. Mm -hmm. I noticed you mentioned that you went up to Suribachi. Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> what happened is, after I was, my outfit was re relieved, uh, <clears throat> I hadn't, no one had showered or shaved or <laughs> cleaned up for about 10, 10 to 12 days. So because I was in communication with the ships, uh, uh, I went down to the beach and um, uh <clears throat> went aboard one of the, uh, uh, I guess they were L one a large landing ship that land, could land tanks and material LST. and what have you. LST, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, they said, "Sure, come aboard, have a shower, but don't stay long because uh, we're we're leaving as soon as uh, we unload." So um, I went aboard, got a shower, put on the same clothes. Uh, had my sergeant with me, uh, Sergeant uh, William Colgan. And uh, we said, while we're here, it's, you know, now we're, we're back from the front lines. We're in an area that's considered secure. Uh, <clears throat> and we said, let's go uh, up to Suribachi. And so we walked up to Suribachi. It was uneventful. There was no uh, fire shooting or anything like that. And then when we got up there, um, there was a bunch of guys grouped together, and there were, uh, pictures were taken. So they said to me, quick, quick, get in the picture. And um, so I got in the picture. And that's the whole story on Suribachi. Uh, <clears throat> and was the flag up there? Oh, sure. By that time, th this was, I think it was around, I have some notes. I think it was March 2nd. Mm -hmm. So I Were you aware of this flag raising up there? Oh, you, sure. You were? Well, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, uh, everyone could see it. Everyone, the island. It was the most uh, really uplifting thing that happened because the first three days were very rough uh, with artillery going back and forth, and uh, uh, they, the Japs even had a uh, sort of uh, uh, a 
rocket, it was a huge rocket. We think it was a 500 pound bomb that was put together and launched off a wooden platform. But we called it a trolley. Uh, it just struggled uh, and landed behind us all the time. They had no control of where it was going. Uh, so um, uh, <clears throat> the flag went up and uh, cheers went up. But when the flag came down, that was almost a disheartening thing. Uh, <clears throat> because oh, about that time, and I can't say for sure now, the uh, Navy aircraft carrier, it was an aircraft carrier that got hit and blew up. Um, and you could see the fire, the flames at night. Uh, the sky got, and that was very disheartening because the next morning the ships were gone. Everybody ran for cover because we were under attack, and uh, <clears throat> uh, a Navy uh, a pilot crossed the island. It was at night, uh, chasing a Jap plane that dropped a bomb not too far from where we were, and the air liaison officer. Uh, he had the job of disarming it. <laughs> Never told us. Uh, so when the flag came down, you know, these things were very, made you very unhappy, nervous about it. But it went up shortly thereafter and it stayed up. And that was the second uh, uh, time the flag was flown. Mm. But I didn't know at that time the details of uh, where the flag came from and all that. Mm. Could you describe about walking in this volcanic? Sand. Yeah. yeah. Well, what was that like? well, well, most of the biggest encounter was when you hit the beach, and uh, going up the uh, terraces, um, they were just uh, black sand and very loose, so you could literally dig a foxhole with your elbows. You know, you just uh, <clears throat> burrowed down uh, uh, <clears throat> to protect yourself. Uh, it was. Um, it, it wasn't very stable. Now inland. Where the caves were, uh, the, uh, it was sort of a, a sandstone, and they could carve the caves right out of the sandstorm, the stone, and uh, they did a tremendous job. Of course, they had many years to prepare that island, uh, <clears throat> but you know, just an example: the first cave that I came across and was interested in, and the last one. Uh, the entrance was down this way, and there's another entrance down this way. It went down, and then the entrance to the cave was this way, 90 degrees to it. So a bomb, uh, an explosion of this end, went out the other end and didn't affect the people in, in, in the cave. And, and the caves were, they had uh, bunks carved out of the walls of the cave where they uh, uh, slept. They just put rice pads down and and um, slept on the rice pads. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, once we were told not to go in the caves anymore, the guys uh, never would, went beyond a cave entrance. Um, uh, <clears throat> the guys would drop hand grenades down uh, ventilation tubes. See, if you find ventilation tubes, they just threw hand grenades. But the demolitions team played a big role. They, they came by and uh, they, they blocked up all those caves. And that's why so many of the Japs are unaccounted for, because they're buried in those caves. Um, oh, you mentioned in this about uh, Japanese infiltrating into your lines. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, let's see, what was that about? With dynamite yeah. or something? Uh, it was about fifth or sixth day into the operation. And of course, we had these star shells light up the area so we wouldn't see enemy infiltrating. Uh, we had um, uh, three Japs that inf infiltrated in our area, and uh, the guys got them with hand grenades. But in the meantime, I had to discontinue communicating with the ship because uh, uh, radio silence, we didn't know if there were any more coming through, so you had to be alert uh, to spot them if they were coming through. Uh, but uh, they got them with hand grenades, and the, and the dynamite didn't explode. I never figured that out, but uh, they were on their way probably to um, 
explode uh, or damage the uh, supply depot or the stockpile that we had there for ammunition and guns. Mm -hmm. How long were you on? Oh, um, you? Well, uh, it was about D plus 20 uh, 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 because the island had become pretty much secure and the whole division was put aboard ship and uh, we went to Okinawa. And, um, but um, we were in reserve and probably going to be replacements if needed and we didn't land. So we just... Did you witness any of the kamikaze attacks? Well, it was too far at sea to see it uh, on, the, on the island. All we could see was uh, smoke from where the shells were uh, Why about on the ships? There on the ship? Kamikaze attacks on the American Navy. Um, I did not observe any. They, the one that I mentioned about the aircraft carrier, uh, that was a kamikaze. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I forget the name of the ship. Yeah, was it mm. Franklin that was in I think so. Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Um, did you experience that typhoon that struck the Okinawa area that was so destructive? No, no, okay. no. because uh, at some point when they felt we weren't needed anymore in reserve, Okinawa, we uh, returned to um, Maui and set up camp again. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that you were uh, at Guam for, with prisoners of war. Well, what happened is, now we're on Maui, and uh, <clears throat> they uh, had a Colonel Waldorf who uh, uh, was organizing a battalion to go to China. And, uh, well, that was the thing in the Marines in those days, to be a China Marine, you know. If you're going to stay in the service and move up, you had to be a China Marine. At least we thought so. So I volunteered. And my buddies um, Hugh Hudgens and Jim Russell and Colonel Waldorf gave each of us a company. So um, we took off and we were allowed to bring anything and everything we could get our hands on because we had to live on our own merits uh, <clears throat> without any help from the Chinese. But instead of going to China, they put us ashore on Guam, took Colonel Waldorf away from us gave us another colonel and made uh, MPs out of two companies. I was one of them, made MPs. And Hugh Hudgens, my other buddy, uh, he was placed, put in charge of a, a prison camp of 2,000 Japs. Uh, the, um, uh, the MP work was for the uh, harbor. Uh, they have a huge harbor in, um, in Guam and uh, it was helped by the fact that uh, Americans built um, a jetty, oh, I say at least a mile long, maybe more, uh, that it could encase the whole fleet in that harbor, and they could put an su anti-submarine net across the opening uh, <clears throat> to protect the fleet, which they didn't do. That would be too much concentration, I'm sure. But um, so we had that 21 miles of uh, uh, harbor, uh, ships were coming in, unloading. Uh, we had to um, uh, constantly uh, uh, have put guards on each ship because the captains would want uh, material, merchant captains would want their materials delivered safely. Uh, in fact, one time we had an escort, a con convoy of uh, oh, about 12 to 15 truckloads of beer to the army base up on Island Command. And well, the orders were, don't have any of that beer disappear. So we had one uh, guard on each uh, truck. Uh, I had a lead vehicle and got it up to the army base and um, waiting for an officer to sign off on it. Otherwise, it was going to go back to where it came from. <laughs> it got delivered. All of it? All of it. I didn't get a sample. <laughs> okay. Um, after your duty in Guam, what happened? Well, that was it. Um, we didn't go to China, so uh, we decided um, uh, <clears throat> that we'd had enough, and uh, uh, I put in to um, uh, uh, get released. 
and um, I got released and um, uh, I had to wait for a replacement before they released me, but I got released and um, came back home and arrived in New York City on April 1, 1946. Hmm. What was your reaction to the atomic bomb being dropped in Japan? Oh, the best thing that could have happened. It would have been really, really tough. It took three divisions to take Iwo, and that's the Four Mile Island. Uh, <clears throat> you know how many Americans would have to be used to, to take Tokyo or Japanese island? Uh, it, it would have been a dreadful encounter. I thought I think it was the greatest thing, and I admire um, Harry Truman for making the decision. Mm -hmm. How do you think the, your service with the Marines changed or affected your life? Well, it was uh, favorable. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't let it influence me um, in a military fashion, because uh, I was warned about that. But um, uh, it gave me a lot of confidence. It um, gave me um, uh, opportunities to be in charge. Uh, I was, in, you know, for a fellow 24 years old out of college, uh, I had a lot of responsibilities that I don't think I've ever had since. So um, I, I, I enjoyed the, the experience, and, um, uh, and my attitude was, I, I would say, suit, uh, suitable for civilian life. Did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I attended um, St. John's Law School after the war for two years until I was uh, hired by Arthur Anderson, the famous Arthur Anderson that you read about. Famous? <laughs> seven, seven years I worked for Arthur Anderson, and um, uh, <clears throat> so um, I never went back to law school because I, I really enjoyed the work, and I, from then on I moved um, to one of the clients. American Bosch Armor Corporation at a, at a high level. I was a controller and, uh, of a, a New York Stock Exchange listed mm -hmm. company. And then I was, uh, from there I went to North American Phillips, a large international company, and spent seven years there. And um, lastly, I joined the um, AMREP Corporation. AMREP Corporation was uh, headquartered in New York, but they moved to uh, all the um, uh, administrative functions to um, New Mexico. And uh, I was given the job to move the administrative functions to New Mexico. And uh, I stayed there until I retired. Um, have you uh, been active or joined any uh, veterans organizations? Yes, I'm with the American Legion. And we have a great uh, group in, um, in Manhasset. We, we, we have 40, 50 people attend each meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, um, did, did you marry after you returned home? Uh, yes. Um, after I returned home, uh, uh, and was stable in my job, I married uh, Jacqueline Horan, uh, and. Um, we moved to Garden, Garden City. I was there for about 20 years, and, uh, and then when I moved to New Mexico, she came out, of course, and uh, I had a daughter, Carol, and um, uh, <coughs> she married uh, while I was out there, and um, my wife passed away while I was out there, and um, I had met and known a girl, a lady, that um, well, I had known her as long as I had known my late wife, and so we decided we'd get married. She'd lost her husband about four years sooner, and uh, through illness, and um, I had to wait about six months until uh, my patient came through. So uh, married uh, Mimi Devenosh. Now, Mimi uh, is accused of only marrying Marines. Her first husband was a colonel in the Marines, and. Uh, uh, and she's quite a gal, uh, uh, and, uh, well, we live in Manhasset and have been very happy. Mm -hmm. Can I stop and go to the next one as well? Okay, uh, we're ready to, if you want to hold, you know, as you talk about each item, you can hold it up 
uh, for Wayne, and he'll be able to move in at it with the camera. Well, I don't really have too much. I've got this map here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh. Have you ever gone to any reunions? Uh, no, I haven't. I almost went to the Iwo Jima reunion, uh, but um, I just did like the attitude uh, of the Japanese that we were guests of the Japanese while we were visiting on the island, and we had to arrive on the island and leave the island the same day. So I just thought that was not something I would be happy with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, have you, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that you were in service with? Oh yes, yes. Jim Russell, the fellow that I mentioned, um, he was in my wedding party. Uh, Jim um, passed away in 1991, and um, Hugh Hudgens, who um, had the Japanese prison camp, uh, he's uh, now living in North Carolina. And I just recently got a letter from him. Uh, uh, we're in touch. Yeah. Well, I now, what about that photograph there? Well, this is a photograph of me on the, uh, on Maui. So that was taken in '44. '44. This is before Iwo. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. I don't know if you want to talk about this. This little book I had in my pocket uh, uh, names all the ships that were assigned to the well, Maybe we could just hold it up, you yeah. know, a sample. Yeah, and uh, well, I could. Uh, uh, this is a list of all the ships, and the circle ones are the ones that I actually uh, spotted for. Mm -hmm. Hmm? And, uh, you know, it included. Well, as I mentioned, the Nevada, and the Terry is a destroyer, the Lutz is a destroyer, the Leary, Caps, the Stanley, the Fulham, Haworth, and Robert Talbot. There were the ships. The LCIs, um, they had names like, you know, the, the rocket ship was called Prospect. Then the 40 millimeter ship was called Texaco. And the mortar ship was web feast. And, you know, and we had to use a code. I don't remember the name of this code, um, but it was changed daily. So that when we talked to the ship, uh, the target couldn't be identified by the enemy. Uh, we operated, we had a grid, as you can see, uh -huh. the grids on the map, uh, and each grid would be the initial identification, you know, in grid area so and so. Uh, target, look for uh, this uh, bunker, uh, describe it, and, and the ship may or may not see it. Uh, uh, so you'd have to give them some guidance. Uh, <clears throat> and sometimes uh, you had to um, uh, <clears throat> tell them to uh, uh, fire when ready. Sometimes you'd say uh, fire at my command, which meant that um, I would call any adjustments that I would do that. Here's some um, uh, interesting thing. When I got the flag, I think it's over there. It's in that red, red uh, bag. Uh, it came out of a knapsack. Uh, came out of a knapsack. Thank you. And uh, it had some literature in it. Uh, had pictures, but um, uh, some of the literature, uh, I, I don't have it because I turned it in to G2. Mm -hmm. Now this was a picture that was in the flag? Uh, uh, yes, this is the picture of the flag. Oh, I don't know which one is. This is a picture that was with the flag, so that must have been the unit. Yes. Hold it like that. I'm going to z uh, zoom in on it, and then just walk walk up to the top. Too bad we didn't know what it said. <laughs> well, I had it translated, and um, the story is that uh, it was a custom for the Japanese when they went into service. They'd have a party, 
and um, uh, everyone at the party would wish him luck and make uh, comments like that, and that's what these comments are here. Uh -huh. Now, the only distinguishing thing is this is silk, mm -hmm. so it meant it was an officer. Uh -huh. uh, that's how we understood it. And uh, so, uh, thinking it was an officer, I sent all the papers back uh, to G2 uh, to see if there was any useful information there. But none. All I got back was I didn't, get, I didn't give the flag. I got this back and, and some of this stuff, see, which is just calling cards and. One thing I can't show you, this is kind of funny if you want some humor. Uh, since I had this Jeep, I was able to uh, pick up a Japanese 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, it was damaged. I don't know if you could fire it, but I had visions of sending it back to the States and uh, it would be in the lobby of St. John's, you know, or something like that. And so I got it back uh, as far as Maui. and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so I was in front of my tent, and the captain, at that time the captain of the group, Jasco, where our outfit was called Jasco, joined the Salt Signal Company. Uh, uh, Jasco said, Vic, you got to get rid of that. And he says, we're having a general's inspection, and I've signed off saying I've inspected the area and there are no enemy weapons around. Well, I tried to bury it, and the damn thing was ground was too hard and uh, couldn't do it, so we went to a movie that night. Coming back, we saw a big latrine. Uh, so my buddies, I, I lived with two guys in, in a tent. They said, Vic, this is the place to get rid of this. We'll help you. So <clears throat> we, it was a three-man carry. The tripod got stuck going down a little bit, but we managed to get it down. And the next day, what they do is they open these things. They uncover them. They throw kerosene down and, and ignite them, burn them. So the captain calls me in and he says, well, you did it again. General looks down and says, damn it, the first time I've looked down one of these latrines and faced an enemy weapon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, <clears throat> my good friend Russell, uh, uh, what's his name? Roselle. Roselle um, went to school with, uh, he's written up in Collier's, had uh, a leg shot off, 23 pints of blood and all that sort of nonsense. But uh, anyway, we survived. Now, on the cover of that, that's your, that's the patch? That's the division the patch. The fourth division. Yeah. Okay, let me just get a shot of that. Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay.